Open Forum is a live Bible questions and answers program. What kind of Bible question do you have? What subject is of concern to you? Well, this is a program designed to offer you the opportunity to call in and ask questions or comments relating to the Bible. Our host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann, will respond by going to the Bible, the infallible Word of God. Our program is hosted Monday through Friday beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except Wednesdays when the program begins at noon Eastern. Call our toll-free number at 888-969-9883. Again, that's 888-969-9883. There will be someone there to answer your call and give you simple instructions to be on the program. You can also join us through Zoom video by going to ebiblefellowship.org and clicking the icon at the top. If you're calling in from another country, on our website, select the Toll Free button to find your country's number. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to eBible Fellowship's new Open Forum program. During this time, we're going to open up the phone lines to take your call, and each person is invited to give us a call. If you have a question or a comment you like to make, and I'll try to respond by turning to the Bible, um, that book that God has given us that um, is a powerful book. It's a living and powerful book, and it's a book that has changed the lives of his people, and it has changed them for the good. And, and through the book, the Bible, God has delivered to his people salvation, eternal life, abundance of blessings to be stowed upon them forevermore. And so, yes, the people of God respond with love towards the Bible. We love the Bible. We love the truth of the Bible, even though the truth at times can be um, hard to hear, it, it can be um, troubling, yet we love the truth. And we, um, we delight in finding truth, in searching for truth. Uh, and, and of course, Christ is the truth. He told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So our Bible search when we are studying the Bible, um, you know, um, it can be viewed in an academic kind of way. You get out pen and paper and Bible help books, and, and, um, and, and, and uh, you, you start the process. You start looking into a verse and its words and following it. Yet our real search is for truth and and uh, in that, we can say we're searching for Christ because Jesus is the essence of truth. And so no wonder when we find it, we delight, we delight, we are joyed, we're happy. Um, uh, you know, unlike um, uh, a few things in this world, uh, there's a certain kind of joy that the Lord gives his people in their their pursuit and in their finding of truth and uh it is just a wonderful thing and this is why we keep studying keep studying the more we learn the more the veil comes off the face of christ and the more we're looking into his um his, his holy uh presence and into the face of God, we're, we're seeing God as he is. He is the God of truth. And uh, so that, you know, there are explanations if people um, who are not truly saved, if they really wanted answers to why are these people always studying the Bible? Why are they, um, you know, not interested in other books and well, it, it has to do with our relationship with Christ. And there, 
there are no other books in the world that reveal truth, only the Bible. Well, um, let's see, before we begin, do we have any announcements? Um, uh, well, uh, no, none, none uh, offhand that I can think of. So let's go to the first person on the phone this evening. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yeah, hi, Chris. We know that before the flood waters started in 4990 BC, hmm. somewhere before that had to be the Ice Age. Does Genesis give any kind of a, an account about that? Or is there anywhere in the Bible that talks about that? No. I don't take your No, reason. No, not before the flood. Uh, all, all the, it, you know, um, it, it would be after the flood that after the flood that, um, you know, the climate on the earth would change climate change. Um, and, and, um, it, that's one of the reasons why the, um, the, uh, lifespan of mankind changed dramatically after the flood. You know, we, we read all the way to Noah. Noah's living 6,000 years from creation. That men were living in the hundreds of years. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, and he lived after the flood 350 years. Uh, but it's, it's uh, pretty much in line with the flood that the um, you know, the ages of the patriarchs begins to drop significantly from 900 uh, to um, just around three, four, five hundred uh, for for the next couple of patriarchs, and and then it gets down um, to the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're living roughly about. Uh, you know, 175, 180 years. Um, and, and then in the time of Moses, the Lord caps it with um, what he said in Psalm 90, man's days will be 70 or 80 years. And it so happens that that is a, just about um, perfectly describing the average lifespan of men and women today they live between 70 and 80 years. With all the modern technology, uh, it, it still hasn't um, increased, really, what God said in uh, Psalm 90. Uh, and, and so we have to ask, why? Why the change? Um, uh, I, I think Mr. Camping put forth a theory um, that I think is true, which was that there was a, a sort of um, a, a water um, um, a, a water vapor that that was um, in the heavens. It, it was like in space, uh, deep space water clouds uh, that served to protect man from harmful rays. Um, and yet the Lord brought the earth, at the same time, the rain is falling from heaven and waters are coming up from the deep. The Lord brought the earth or, or these clouds into the pathway of the earth. So um, it would meet and, and there would be this tremendous deluge, uh, so much water that it would rise 15 cubits above the highest mountain. And that would take away again, some of the protection that was built into the original creation. Uh, you, you know, God originally designed man to live forever. Some people read the Bible and they see that Adam lived to be 930. And um, uh, Methuselah uh, it has the oldest recorded age of 969. And, and right away, you know, they roll their eyes, oh, sure. And they don't understand that the human body was, was a perfect machine. It, it was created without any um, 
a disease without any um you know ability to fail well, um, it, it was perfect it was good in every way and and therefore once god um smote man slew him in his soul and and uh, um brought the consequences of man's sin upon the body um then over the course of time now the body would begin to fail but it's like anything when you have a perfect machine absolutely perfect well to go from living forever which man would have done if if he simply obeyed and kept the law that god has had established about that tree it, it the body was designed to live forever on the earth the earth was designed to function forever and and so god also would have had protections in the earth itself to allow longevity to allow man to live and live and live and and yet once man sin then the body starts breaking down and to go from um eternity you know um um conditional eternal life to a period of 930 years and people think oh that's too great an age no that's a pittance that's nothing 930 years uh where's adam now well adam's adam's dead long dead he's been dead for thousands of years for about you know over over um let's see he lived the say the first thousand so he's been dead over 12,000 years shows you what a pittance it is and 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 the foolishness of men to um you know to give up um all idea of eternity by forsaking the things of god in the bible wanting nothing to do with them. i'm going to live my life yeah you're going to live if if a thousand years or 930 years is a pittance what's 70 or 80 years or or of course you know it's an average so some live 90 or 100 others die at 50 or 60. and and what is that that's nothing nothing at all and and so um the protection i i think one of the protections would have been this uh water vapor canopy uh, in the heavens protecting against harmful rays and and uh it it stayed in place all the way until the flood and after the flood it wasn't there anymore it wasn't there and and man's days began to shorten and um the the flood just rearranged the geography of the earth and um the climate of the earth um and apparently um there in, in certain parts of the world there there was a ice age and and uh, the dinosaurs died at, uh, sometime after the flood they didn't die before the flood or uh well most of them would have died in the flood but uh the lord would have saved a pair of them at least and and brought them on the ark and they would have reproduced but uh, maybe due to climate uh again who knows uh how how uh you know these details worked out but um yeah uh before the flood there's nothing in the bible about any kind of ice age but thank you okay thank you. you're welcome thank you for calling and sharing and let's go to the next person on the phone welcome to our question and answer program please go ahead with your call hi good evening chris how are you I'm doing well, thank you. Please go ahead. Can we look at Acts 3 verses 19 to 21? Okay, Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since 
the world began. Where it talks about in verse 19, when the times of refreshing shall come, where um refreshing is um Strong's number four, um G403, which comes from G404, meaning to revive, and which in turn comes from G a uh, compound word G303, which means every man or each, and 5594, which which um has to do with um Wax, um, wax cold, um, as mm -hmm. in, uh, Matt, Matthew twenty four twelve. Does this have to do with um God after the end of the church age setting His hand a second time to recover the remnant of His people, as in the saving of the great multitude during the period of the latter rain? Um. Yeah. The it, it's interesting. We read um, in a few places um, where where the latter rains in view, and it it speaks of um, the spirit uh, coming in. For instance, in Genesis Genesis um, forty five or forty six with Jacob, and we we read in Genesis forty five. Um, in verse 25, and they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt, and Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. The um, spiritual picture, because we know the famine is called Great Tribulation in Acts chapter 7. Joseph, after two years of the famine, has revealed himself to his brothers, uh, finally, and the brothers went back home and told their father that would have been something to, uh, you know, to see and hear, because remember, these are the same brothers that had told their father uh, they didn't know what happened to Joseph, um, but they found his bloody coat, and, and uh, um, I'm sure they would have had to um, you know, explain, and, and they were probably deathly afraid of the whole thing because now they're take, they're going to bring their father to Egypt where he'll meet Joseph, and Joseph can tell them everything that happened. But, but anyway, uh, this is after the two years. The two years of famine um, when uh, Jacob and Israel are in the land of Canaan represents the first part of the actual 23-year Great Tribulation period, the 2300 evening mornings, which works out to six years and almost four months, from May 21, 1988 through September 1994, there is a famine, and uh, the people of God are, um, you know, they don't know what they're going to do. Finally, um, historically, after two years, they heard there's corn in Egypt, and then Joseph reveals himself, and that's a picture of the latter rain, the latter rain. And, and we know this without question because God identifies the period as great tribulation, and the breaking up of the period um, fits what we have learned at the time of the end perfectly. For instance, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and that's a little, it's in this chapter, Genesis 45 at the beginning, he said to them that there's a seven-year famine, it's been two years in the land, it'll be five more years. And now, now just think of that as great tribulation. He's saying it's seven-year total, so they can know the, they can know these dates. They can know, because they know what year it is then, the famine started two years earlier, 1879. 
Now there's a change. Something's changing in the program. 1877, they're going to leave Canaan, go into Egypt. But they also know that it will end in the year 1872. Three dates, 1879, 1877, 1872. Beginning, dividing point, end of the seven-year famine. Compare that to what we learned, and uh, it, it's just, um, you know, remarkable we learned the actual 23-year Great Tribulation or spiritual famine on the church. It's beginning, 1988. It's dividing point, 1994. It's end, 2011. The, just those three main dates. Those three main dates. It, it matches perfectly. And, and so here, uh, it's the dividing point which identifies with the Jubilee year 1994 when the latter rain began, and Joseph is yet alive. Jacob's heart uh, fainted at first, for he, uh, I added the word first, he believed them not, and they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said it is enough. His spirit revives. It, um, it, it reminds of um, Samson. Samson, when he was slaying um, the Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. And, um, well, let's see. That's Judges. <clears throat> Judges chapter... Jephthah's chapter 11. Um, chapter 15. 15. Yeah. yeah, chapter 15. And um, in verse, Judges 15, verse 14. And when he had come unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of Jehovah came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place uh, Rama, Ramoth Lehi. Now, it's been a long time, but I believe there is a relationship with Ramoth Lehi to, um, that ties in with the latter rain. I, I can't remember it now. And, and notice he was sore athirst and called on Jehovah, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore, he called the place thereof en Hakor, which is in which is in Lehi unto this day. Okay, so he's doing battle with the Philistines, and he slays a thousand, which points to completeness, and he 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 killed them with the jawbone of an ass. Um, an ass can represent people. Um, uh, Exodus 13, 13, you're to redeem uh, an ass. Um with, with sacrifice, and if you do not redeem it, you're to break its neck, um, which, you know, redemption is salvation language. Um, Christ riding a, a, an ass into Jerusalem and, and uh, points to, or, or when uh, he, he told the disciples, go and, and, uh, and loose them, and bring them to me, and then he sat on them. It's a picture of salvation ruling over the sinner. 
and to sit is to rule. And um, and so the jawbone has to do with the mouth, and God did open up the mouth of Balaam's donkey uh, to to proclaim truth, and and the Lord spared Balaam's donkey. He said, if um, the donkey had not pulled aside, surely he he would have spared the donkey and slain Balaam because um, Balaam uh, is is a picture of the unsaved in the congregations, and the donkey is humbly representing the elect in the congregations at the time when God's judgment is to begin at the house of God, and those in the church, um, as typified by Balaam, they're insistent, we have to keep going towards the wrath of God, and and we we must go this way where where the elect can see God gives us eyes to see like the donkey and he wants to pull out of the way because he knows it's a way to destruction but anyway the donkey represent the jawbone of an ass represents um the people of God the hand of Samson would be the hand of Christ moving in the lives of his people and and through uh, their mouths, you know, that whole process of um, uh, we we compare spiritual with spiritual, the Holy Ghost teaches, but but we speak, we speak, it, it comes through our mouth. It's not a very flattering image for teachers or for any of God's people who proclaim the Word of God. It's a humbling image. Um, it, it's not even a living donkey. It's a, it's a dead jawbone. It's a it's a you know a dry bone uh, that that the Lord uses just like in Ezekiel thirty seven the valley of dry bones definitely not flattering uh, to to those that God utilizes to accomplish His purpose and here it, it's to slay the Philistines and and so the word of God like a two edged sword it accomplishes salvation and judgment. Um, and then notice Samson, a type of Christ, and he and Christ um, can also represent the body of Christ. He he's done speaking, he's done speaking, and he throws it away. It, it's the church, it's the congregation. The Lord used the church to proclaim the gospel for almost two thousand years, and then he got done speaking. It, um, the two witnesses finish their testimony. To testify, to give testimony, you speak. They finished, and, and they finished because God was finished with them. And, and so too here, Samson, uh, Christ is finished with the using the particular testimony uh, within the churches and congregations, so he just throws it away, and then he's a thirst and the, the water comes out of um, um, a, a hollow place, or God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. See, the water coming out, the, the latter rain is coming out a second time after the first. The first would identify with Samson's activity with the jawbone. And now, once it's cast away, it, it's a picture of those, you know, that have um, come out of the churches and congregations, and, and yet God is still using his people. He's still using the same process, too. Same process, uh, it, because the, the water is coming out of the jawbone, um, in a more miraculous way, uh, it, uh, you know, as it, it went to the ground, and and it gave Samson drink. It gave the body of Christ drink, causing revival. What churches call revival, really the Bible points to the fact that, um, you know, God's um, um, gospel program appeared to be dead, once he ended the church age, and uh, I remember, and uh, you know, recently reading the book 1994, Mr. Camping was 
uh, going into detail about how the Gospels pinched off more and more, less and less are being saved, and it, it would be after 1994, after the, the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit and during the latter reign, that, that he would, um, you know, um, come to be corrected on that and, and modify that teaching uh, to, to realize there was actually a great multitude, an abundance of gospel water was going to flow forth. And uh, and so we we see that uh, that kind of information that news encourages the hearts of the people of God. It and looking back, it, it did um, the uh, you know when we first started hearing of God's plan and intention to save a great multitude, it, it was a major change. Prior to that, it was just famine, spiritual famine apostasy in the churches and and you, and when you went to the churches you saw it you saw it there was a uh, very very few um true believers as we thought at that time and and yet it was outside the church and god um you know opening up that information really encouraged us thank you very much you're welcome. Thank you for calling and asking that good question. And let's go now to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Please go ahead with your question. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Ezekiel 28, 3. Behold, thou art wiser. Well, let, let's read um, verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. <clears throat> May I know what is the spiritual meaning of that? Like, uh, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Um, well, uh, verse verse four: With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord Jehovah, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, uh, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible, the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness, um, and, and they shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God. In the hand of him that slayeth thee, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord Jehovah. I think that um, you, you know um, that that this is the Lord addressing mankind. Uh, you know, um, there there's a difficulty when we're looking at Tyrus um, because it, it's hard to uh, distinguish or to tell the difference. Is it is it mankind? Or is it the uh, corporate church? And that's because uh, mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. In, in the beginning, mankind um, was in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And, and that was God um, basically establishing an outward representation of his kingdom on the earth. The 
um, the, um, the Garden of Eden, we would say, was the first outward representation of God's kingdom on the earth. There was no reason for it. Why would God, um, you know, set some limits and call this area the Garden of Eden when, when the whole world was perfect? But he did so in order to, um, you know, set a pattern and establish certain principles. And, and so, in other words, mankind, just like Israel later, thousands of years later, Israel had a special relationship with God in their day. They became the outward representation of God's kingdom on the earth, just like the corporate churches had a special re relationship with God, became the outward representation representation of God's kingdom on the earth. And sometimes God will make reference um, to, to um, judging um, one of these outward um, representatives, and he'll, he'll, uh, he'll say it was like the Garden of Eden before him, and yet as his wrath came, he turned it into a desolate wilderness behind him. So there he's, he's likening, you know, the fruitfulness, the, um, the, the green things, the, the abundance of green grass and trees, um, the language of the Bible, as far as the Lord establishing one of these uh, types and figures, these outward representation, not the actual kingdom, but the outward representation of God's kingdom. And then when he judges it, 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 it becomes like a wasteland, like the, the rest of the earth. That's why there is a similarity with Tyrus, and Tyrus can point to both mankind, especially in his original relationship with God, um, very much God's orig original relationship with mankind, it was similar to his relationship with Israel, his relationship with those in the churches and congregations. And, and uh, so um, man was in the Garden of Eden. He was perfect. He was perfect. That's what it says later in this chapter in uh, Ezekiel 28, in verse 12, Son of man... Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. Man was perfect, which means he was perfect in wisdom. Perfect in wisdom in his beginning. You know, God also speaks of the church's beginning um, and, and how they had, had great love. Uh, I believe he, he gets into that in the book of Jeremiah. Um, and, and so there could be a historical application to Israel's beginning and, and also to the church's beginning. But then they fall away. See, it's a repeat. Perfect man in the Garden of Eden, perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty. And then he, he goes astray. He sins, causing the, the wrath of God to come upon the garden, to come upon man and the whole creation. Same thing with Israel. The wrath of God comes upon them finally. Same thing with the church, the wrath of God. So none of these outward representations of God's kingdom ever 
continue because of sin, and and uh, it's only the actual eternal kingdom of God made up of all those truly saved that will continue on. So here, I think God is addressing Tyrus, and he says, well, first of all, thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. For your heart to be lifted up, that's pride, that's arrogance, that's sin. It's, it's according to man's fallen nature. So we know it's not talking about man um, as he lived perfectly in the garden. This is after the fall. Uh, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. It's, um, you know, the, the, the vestiges of man's condition in his original creation remain until today with, with man's pride, thinking he is something, thinking he's, um, you know, he, he's a little God. That, that's how people tend to view themselves. I will do as I please, like he is a sovereign, he will dictate the course of his own life, and uh, he thinks he is all wise when it comes to himself and how he's to live, and all and often when it comes to others. Um, and and this is probably, again, uh, we were created in the image and likeness of God. We God uh, in uh, Luke four, in Luke Luke chapter, no Luke um, Luke three, the end of Luke three, the last verse, verse thirty eight. It's a long genealogy, and it says, "Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God." God created Adam. Therefore, Adam was God's son. Uh, and, and this is the noble, honorable um, state of man in his original creation to be called the son of God based on the fact that God made him from the dust of the ground. And, and so people, they, uh, of course, sin has ravaged the earth. It's ravaged mankind. It's, it's polluted and perverted and distorted and ruined that image again and again and again with a, a man's own dirty deeds and, and the, the filthy uh, conduct and behavior and thought word and deed that he is engaged in, yet still within, still within is, is this sense this sense of this high nobility and wisdom. And, and, and so uh, I think uh, that's what God is addressing in verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom, see, the Lord is saying, it's not the wisdom of God uh, you, God gives his people wisdom who is Christ. God gives his people wisdom through the word, the Bible. It's not that. It, it's man's own wisdom. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and gotten gold and silver into thy treasures and so forth. So it, in a way, uh, you know, God is just um, um, going with the the uh, very thoughts of men with their beliefs, their understandings, uh, that, that they think they're the all wise ones. Just listen to the atheist. He knows it all. He knows it all. He knows all more than God. He, he'll tell you, he'll tell you, uh, uh, you know, uh, the faults of God. He criticizes God, the God of the Bible. It, the, the atheist is uh, more noble, more honorable, purer, holier, more righteous, more just, kinder, 
and and every any other attribute you can think of than God. At least that's how he views himself. That's a, and, and there's a growing number of atheists in the world. The the growth of atheism in well mostly in Western society. The growth of atheism in Western society, I believe, corresponds not to the decline but to the fall of the church age. Um, you know, over the last 40, 50 years, or or since 1988, uh, as as the church has gone down, atheists like to say, "Well, you're a Christian. Um, you're a geographical Christian." That is, because you're born in the West, you're born into a Christian nation. Well, you know, sorry to disappoint them, but that this nation and the Western nations haven't been Christian for about five decades. No, th this is definitely secular society. And what we're seeing in secular society in all these nations is the decadence that um, you know, moving away from the Bible, from the holy God of the Bible has wrought, and and uh, the growth in atheism is a result of uh, geographical atheism. You, you don't see it in other lands, only where the church was. Where the church was and where the church fell because God caused it to fall and ended it, and it left sort of a vacuum, and 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 uh, the Lord permitted the uh, athe atheistic professors to, um, you know, fill fill the colleges and and um, fill the heads and minds of uh, a great many young with nonsense and and ridiculous theories and so forth. And they know it all. They know there was uh, a big bang so many billions of years ago. Absolutely. Absolutely, no question about it. They know there's evolution. Absolutely no proof. It's all by faith. Uh, um, you know, it's their belief. And, and yet, uh, see, it's their wisdom. It's their wisdom. Their wisdom is worthy of mockery. And I think uh, behind this, that, that's what God's getting at. Um, you know, your wisdom, your understanding, and, um, and so forth. Uh, just... Uh, something to go along with this, I think, would be found in 1 Corinthians 1. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 says in um, verse, verse um, well, I'll start in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And here God is referring to the wisdom uh, of the wise and understanding of the prudent as far as the people who, who reject the Bible. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish? the wisdom of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So there the Lord, um, you know, really addresses the uh, very, of course, God is fully aware of it. God's the one who designed um, this um, distinction or, or how the Bible is viewed 
by men of the world and how men of the world are viewed by God. Uh, they think they're all wise in the Bible and its teaching is foolishness, and the reality is the reverse. As um, you know, it says in a couple of the Psalms, the fool has said in his in his heart, there is no God. And and God says, by the wisdom of God. Um, how how that go? Um, well, I turn by the wisdom of God. Um, the uh, I'll go back there real quick just to get it straight. First Corinthians one um, twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. And, and that can only mean God has fostered their unbelief, fostered the, the whole ridiculous theory of evolution, fostered the even more ridiculous theory of origins, because they have no theory of origins, actually, and allowed them to um, present themselves as scientific and wise, and, and anyone who... Uh, steps back and thinks about it for five minutes, real, realizes there, there's, there's no science, and it's anything but wisdom that they're putting forth. Well, thank you for thank you, Chris. And sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our open forum program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, good evening, Mr. McCann. Can you go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, please? Okay, Daniel 7, 8. Um, that says, I consider the horns. Uh, well, let's back up a little bit. And verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And, and one more, behold, please. And, and oh, behold, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And one more, please. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. Daniel 8, 9. And out of one of them, um, well, again, I'll, verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven, and now of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Uh, sometimes the Lord uses uh, saved men to accomplish his purposes. And uh, uh, and it just uh, was thinking, it, it, it's, it, this talking at all, at all about Alexander the Great, and uh, what do you think about that, Mr. McCann? And, and, and if not, uh, who is the Lord talking about here? And thank you. Well, yeah, um, some um, have have put forth, uh, you know, that some of the prophecy that we find in Daniel uh, is is referring to um, some of the uh, the the kings that that rose up uh, basically in the period of after the Persians conquered Babylon, you know, for a few hundred years there, including Alexander the Great, um, and I, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of struggle with that uh, because, um, you know, where where do we get it from? Where do we get the tie-in? And basically, we're looking at secular history. Uh, what we're we're looking at things the Bible says, and we we have some information from secular history and we're saying okay that's a match um and i don't i just don't see um 
the Bible directing us to that. Uh, you know, the Bible is an eternal, internal book, internal book. Um, that's why I compare spiritual with spiritual can be understood to be scripture with scripture. There, the boundaries of the Bible are Genesis through Revelation, um, stay within the landmarks, the ancient boundary lines um, when seeking truth. And we know when people go outside those ancient landmarks, when, when they go beyond um, the limits of Scripture, and they start, um, you know, uh, they're, they're seeing something in the Bible, and in their time, in their generation, normally they're saying, okay, now this uh, man over here, this man over here, uh, or this country, uh, like some, say, Russia during the time of the Soviet Union was prophesied in the Bible. It wasn't. Some say the man of sin was the Pope or some particularly evil man like Hitler. And no, uh, it wasn't either of them. The man of sin was Satan himself. And, and normally, uh, it going outside the Bible is um, bound to lead to error, to um, incorrect doctrine. Um, now, now, it's true, we can learn a whole lot in the Bible about a particular subject, like uh, God judging the church, the apostasy of the church, the characteristic of the end-time church going after signs and, and um, supernatural um, activity, tongues falling over backwards, um, the charismatic movement. We, we see all that in the Bible clearly, and it's speaking about an entity that that is the church. There's no guesswork about that. And and then uh, not that we were proving it by the uh, things that are happening in the world, but it just matches the things the Bible's saying. Likewise, with the world's abounding iniquity, Matthew twenty four twelve, iniquity will abound. Uh, at the time of the end, or Romans chapter 1, where God says, I will give them up. Um, uh, men will, will um, work with or do that with men, which is unseemly. And, and the Lord speaks of homosexual activity. At the time of the end, we have Sodom and Gomorrah that um, gives us a historical situation of homosexual activity. And Jesus said, uh, as it was with Sodom, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So there, uh, in Romans 1, I will give up man, is the word deliver, and that is used it, um, in regard to judgment. So we, we have that information, we have the timeline, we can pinpoint the end to uh, our, our um, time period, you know, over these last several years. And it matches, it matches, but we learned it all in the Bible. It's not like we saw all this taking place in the world, and then we went to the Bible to try to find verses to match that. That's, that's not how it should be done at all. Um, so here, it's very complex language. It's veiled language. Uh, it's parabolic language. And... How do we understand parables? You have to look in the Bible. And we we know the ten horns um, God tells us about in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 13, it says in verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And, uh, you know, we, we can see the similarity of the language with Daniel 7. We can tie these things together. And we realize the beast rising up is also Satan. 
um, and 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 we we're on safe ground. We're on safe ground. We we have uh, spiritual with spiritual, scripture with scripture, and and we uh, can develop, or the Lord will teach and develop understanding. He'll he'll give doctrine of what's going on with these kinds of statements. Uh, but again, I'm I'm just not uh, I'm. Uh, you know, very cautious and skeptical whenever someone says, well, you know, this particular figure is, identifies with that historical character. Well, okay, um, now, now how how would you figure that out? Show, show the path. Sh uh, like right here, 10 horns. We can go from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. But how do you go from that language to Alexander the Great? Show the path. And typically, it's just basically, well, you know, uh, in, in Daniel, he's talking about, and, and I don't think those are exactly the verses. There's, an, uh, you know, some other scriptures that speak of kings that are, that are um, uh, you know, they're, um, uh, they're, they're victorious and, and, you um, indicate there's a large conquest. And so they'll they'll just take those ideas and apply it to Alexander the Great. Um, and, and too loose, definitely too loose. Um, and uh, I I want to just stay in the Bible. But thank you. Thank you for that. For calling and sharing. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and sharing your questions and comments and especially the Bible verses we had a chance to read and consider. We have come to the end of our program. Lord willing, we'll have another open forum program tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. We hope you'll be able to join us then. But for now, may you have a good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. Thanks again for joining us for eBible Fellowship's live open forum program. You can call in with your Bible questions Mondays and Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern, and Wednesdays beginning at noon Eastern.